Uh, first of all, welcome to First Encounters on Jeff's official class. And uh, I think you know today is the day of Lord Buddha's Sagandawa. Uh, Lord Buddha was conceived today, enlightened today, and passed in the certified day. So all the virtue we do is like a million times more. I don't know, long as I can tell exactly in <laughs> But uh, it's a good day to have, a, I think, the first class of this particular series. Um, we were in Tucson uh, the last three or four days getting poked and prodded by doctors and dentists and other kinds of things to see if we were still alive. And, uh, and we had a chance to drive by the uh, place where the teaching will take place in October. I think most of you know this course will be repeated in October uh, over a four-day weekend, Columbus Day weekend. Uh, and the crew, I think Gail is in charge of that, but they found a very nice place. And we found out where it was, and we decided to drive by it. And it's really beautiful. It's, the, it's called the Muse, right? And it's, apparently it's an old YMCA. Uh, on 5th Street, right off of 4th Street in Tucson. 4th Street, I, I guess you know, but I just found out, it's, the, it's like the happening street in, in Tucson. It's where all the students come. It's like right across the street from the university. And then it's like the mall in Santa Cruz or, some, or the East Village, except it's only a few blocks long. And, uh, and um, so we drove by, and it's really beautiful. The gym is really beautiful. Uh, it's not really a gym, it's this huge, beautiful place. And it's broken up into different... Uh, rooms now, and um, we also saw a big sign that said uh, rooms for rent. So we figured the three jewels can go in there afterwards, uh, or maybe before. But we're going to talk about that tomorrow. Maybe <laughs> anyway, we got the rents and everything, and uh, I think it'd be a good area. Uh, we also, due to driving to work, um, we did some newspaper and radio interviews about the uh, about the three year retreat, and I guess the the newspaper thing came out the last few days. And then we went to do a radio interview, and the guy was very excited. He's going to run it for five days in a row. Uh, he, he did it like five times over the normal length, and then he wants to do it for a whole week. And then he said in October uh, he'll do another long interview for the teaching in October. Uh, the reason I'm telling you all this is because you guys are going to be the teachers in October. And uh, I've gotten a lot of letters from people, and there have also been ads put in Tricycle and other places uh, for that teaching. So uh, we expect, I don't know, when you expect, you don't get that many, so maybe. Uh, but I think there'll be at least two, three hundred people there. Uh, and we have to be, we'll be breaking out in the mornings. The classes in the mornings will be broken out into uh, smaller classes, because we've gotten feedback from people that when they come into a class and there's 300 people there, you don't feel like you're getting any personal attention and you can't ask questions and things like that. So what we're going to do in October, in the morning classes, uh, they'll be broken out into those little rooms in the, the muse space. And they're very beautiful little rooms uh, with nice hardwood floors. They're used for dance and things like that. And each one of you who survive the next 10 classes uh, will become a teacher. And maybe we'll team up people in pairs. If you're shy, I don't know. Uh, but my idea is to break out the morning classes. You go, you get assigned, you're going to have assigned to five or ten or fifteen students each. And then you have to teach what I'm about to teach. So that's like an incentive uh, for you guys to, to do it seriously now. Okay? And I want everyone to try. You know, I know a lot of you think I'm not a teacher or I never did that. And uh, like I remember the night that Punta came into New York, Pelma was there. The New York class the first time, it was a really rainy night. Only four people showed up for class. And this guy named Punzo, well, he wasn't called Punzo again, right? <laughs> and uh, he walks in and he says, I don't know anything about it. No, I can't teach. I don't know anything about this stuff. Uh, now he's got a regular Friday night class in New York with 70, 80 students coming. Uh, and there are many people like that. So I want all of you to be in the frame of mind that uh, you're going to be teaching this. And even people who listen to the tape or get the video, two years from now, uh, you have to be thinking in terms of teaching what I'm about to teach. The whole idea is a lineage, and we have to continue the lineage. Um, so please keep that in mind. You're also going to get homeworks, and you'll also be responsible to do a quiz when you get into class uh, on Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. We'll be going Wednesday night and, and Saturday afternoons. 
And you should get the schedule from Ellie because there's a break there for some vacation and uh, somebody named Dalai Lama or something like that. And uh, mm-hmm. we'll be at Ken Rinpoche and we'll be busy with, with those things. Um, how many people weren't here for the last, for the first half of this class? Oh boy. Really? Raise your hand again. Ooh, okay. We'll have to do a short summary. Uh, we did the first half of this first class just for good luck out on the lawn on the night we got here, on the night we broke the three year retreat. Uh, but I'll just do a summary, I guess. And then we'll go ahead. This class will be about an hour and then a break for, notice I said in about, uh, <laughs> a break for uh, refreshments. And then we'll go for another hour. And then um, after that, we're going to have a dinner for everyone, so you're invited to dinner, right? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And uh, after that, from six to seven, or however late we go, um, we're going to do the great Sojong ceremony. Sojong means to, once a year, Ken Rinpoche has instituted uh, a, a purification ceremony. And this was done in the great Tantra colleges in Tibet once a year. And instead of the usual monk Sojong, which takes place every twice a month, uh, where you get to purify all the vows that you broke in the last two weeks, um, in Sojong Chamo, you go through all your vows, which means your Pratimoksha vows, your Bodhisattva vows, and your Tantrum vows. So what I'd like to ask is during dinner, uh, everyone write down six pieces of paper, six slips of paper. Okay? They'll be the three best things you did in the last year for your Pratimoksha vows, your Bodhisattva vows, and your Tantrum vows. <coughs> and then there'll be the worst three things you did in the last year for the same thing. If you don't have uh, tattoo vows or bodhisattva vows, then just write it down for your pratimoksha vows. If you don't even have pratimoksha vows, just the best of the ten non-virtues that you avoided and the worst of the ten non-virtues that you did. Okay? And we'll burn them uh, in the fireplace from six to seven. And then from seven o'clock on, I think we have some kind of a celebration starring Sid and Sadie and something like that. Uh, so, so that's the schedule for today. So I guess it looks like I have to go over a little bit of the last class. Um, and that's just to summarize how we got the book that you're about to study. Mm-hmm. I've got to give you the title of the book first. <laughs> There's going to be, as you know, the ACI courses are English track or English and Tibetan track. So I'll be writing Tibetan words up here. You're not responsible for them if you don't want to be. Um, but, you know, most of us have found out that when you get under pressure at the Muse space in Tucson and some smart guy from Fairbanks, Alaska is asking you a question, you can spit out some Tibetan and answer him. And he doesn't know what it means, and you don't know what it means, but <laughs> it hits you off the hook, see? So, so it might be useful to write down a little bit of it, just to so you cover yourself. Uh, so I'll be doing the Tibetan, and now, since we're kind of into Sanskrit, especially that we're doing uh, tantric, starting the Tantric series next year, and a lot of the texts that we'll be using for the seven-year, five to seven-year Tantric series will be Sanskrit which didn't reach today. So uh, I'm going to be writing Sanskrit also, and you should just start getting used to it. So there'll be a Sanskrit track too. Some people might want to do Sanskrit only and English. Some people might want to do English and Tibetan. Some people might want to do all three. If the guy from Fairbanks knows Tibetan, you can try out some Sanskrit <laughs> and um, give him off your back. <laughs> Yeah, it should really go. He's getting cold. Uh, I'll say that it sounds good in Tibetan, and then I'd like you to repeat it. It's, it puts a seed in your mind, and uh, even if you don't get into Sanskrit track this, this lifetime, it might be next time. Say it with And you have to get used to the difference in, in when you're doing Sanskrit, the difference between A and A is very important. So, listen to how I say it. I don't say Uttara. I say Uttara. 
Say Uttara. <laughs> Don't say Tantra, say Tantra. <laughs> yeah. And it becomes important because like the second, uh, the rest of the name description is just how that. Say Shastra. 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 It's like uh instead of ah. Okay. I'll tell you why. Shastra means commentary. Shastra means a sword that you kill somebody with. So you wouldn't want to teach somebody Uttara Tantra. Shastra. You'd want to teach them Uttara Tantra. Shastra. Okay? Because uh, you don't want to kill them, you want to teach them. Uh, but that's a very good example for distinguishing between what we call Wami and Shirdi, and we'll get better at that as the time goes. Uh, there's a word before Uttara Tantra, which is Mahayana. And I'll do it in Sanskrit just for... Those of you in the feeling brave for this sense. <laughs> Tell me if I'm doing anything wrong here. This sense gets another screen. Uh, say Maha. Maha. Yana. Yana. And then when A bumps into U, it changes to O. Uh, Mahayano. Mahayano. Tantra. 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 I'm sorry. Otara. Otara. That's in Sanskrit. Uh, I'm going to write the Tibetan for you. Say gyu. Yeah. Uh, it gets cut off a bit. Just, uh, I might as well teach you right. I mean, we're out here in the desert, nobody's listening. Gyu. Gyu. Lama. Lama. Gyu. Gyu. Lama. Lama. Okay, mm, you might notice that the Tibetan is a little shorter. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to give you the full Tibetan in a minute. But just to go through the words, Mahayana, you know, means big vehicle, type of temple, big capacity. Uh, you're going to get a commentary by one of Jetson Kappa's students yesterday. I'm going to give you the reading. You don't get the reading today because I couldn't finish it because of the doctors and the dentists and everything else. Uh, but Gyasab Jay says it's Maha because of seven different reasons. The big means seven different things. So this book is all about the big capacity people. Basically, it's people who are willing to work for the happiness of every living creature in the universe and aren't concerned only with themselves. Okay, so you go from one to infinite number of beings if you step onto Mahayana. So that's the meaning of Mahayana. Mahayana. Okay. Uttara means uh, Lama. And that's the same as Guru Lama. Lama means what? Teacher. Highest. Uh, but literally it means higher one. Higher one. Okay, so Uttara means higher one. Uh, Gyatsa Dei, when he explains Uttara in his commentary, he says it's Anuttara. Anuttara. Anuttara, some of you may know, is the name of the highest uh, tantric teachings, the highest group of tantric teachings out of the four. And it means Lama Mepa, above Lama, meaning there's nobody Lama above this book. Okay? Like, this is the highest book, Lama. Okay? Um, so Uttara means Anuttara means nothing higher than that. Okay? Tantra, here, which is Q in Tibetan, uh, and that's the Gyu in Gyume Tantra College and Gyutu Tantra College, which means a lineage. Okay? Or it can mean Tantra also. Mm. Tantra usually means the secret teachings of Buddhism as opposed to the open teachings of Buddhism. Uh, here it has nothing to do with that. We're not teaching secret books today. 
Okay, this tantra is not a tantra. Okay, this book is called a tantra because of the meaning of series. Tantra means a series, like a lineage. So when you say uh, Gibe Lama, for example, which is a different spelling, it means the lamas of our lineage. Okay. So tantra means that. Uh, and as we mentioned in, in English, the word tan has come into the words tenuous and tenacity and tendon and distension, extension, meaning stretched out into a series or a line. Okay. Uh, Shastra, Shastra means a cutter, which means a uh, commentary, an explainer of analysis. It breaks, the, it breaks the meaning up. So really what this book is about, it's an, it's an explanation of the series, which is Uttara, and which is about helping all living creatures, Mahayama. So it's a commentary on the series, which is Uttara, and it's about helping a uh, big, big vehicle, big capacity, people who can help all the people in the world. By the way, Mach comes into English with a prenasal, Mach. The H changes to G, G and the M to switch. You get magnitude out of here, Magna Carta, uh, magnificent, things like that, okay, from the Mahayana. Um, now we got to go to the Uttara. Why is it called uh, highest? And you see some people, even like 500 years ago, they're saying, oh, it's the best book of all. So it's called Uttara Tantra. Yeah. Uh, that's not what Gelsen J says. Gelsen J says, think of highest in terms of ultimate. And think of ultimate in terms of the thing that comes at the end. Okay, like we have penultimate in English and ultimate, meaning the thing just before the end and the thing at the end. So think of Uttara as ultimate, but in the sense of the very last teaching. The very last teaching. So really, this is an explanation of the la latter part of the teaching. Okay? That's the meaning of the name of this book. Mm. What teaching is he talking about? It, we, we talked about it already, right? You guys already know. Um, you know that Lord Buddha turned the wheel three times. Uh, the first time, Lord Buddha appeared as a... Is it three times? Yes. <laughs> no for it? <laughs> we'll see. Uh, the first time he turned the wheel as uh, mainly he talked, just after he became enlightened, he talked the Four Noble Truths about suffering and how to get out of suffering and that kind of thing. He didn't say much about emptiness. The second turning of the wheel, he came on big time on emptiness. He said, everything's empty. Nothing in the world has any quality on its own. This pen doesn't have any quality of its own. You don't have any quality of your own. Your mind doesn't have any quality of its own. The world doesn't have any quality of its own. Nothing has any quality of its own. So Winston, you could be a Mahimata. This pen is not blue, right? Yimata. Oh, Mumu Yimata. So it is blue. Mumu Mo Yata. So it has a characteristic of being blue, right? It doesn't have a characteristic of being blue. Oh, it doesn't have any characteristic at all. Or it doesn't have any quality that belongs to itself. So the blue doesn't belong to the pen. So the pen's not blue. He's getting good. Anyway, he said it doesn't have any characters in his own. And obviously, Lord Buddha meant that the blueness of this pen is coming from me, from each person here. How could it be coming from me if everybody sees it the same? Ted Lamb. Uh. How can it be coming from you if everybody sees it in the blue? We all share the same karma to see it as blue. Well. Yeah, you all did the same action in the past to see it as blue. So that means that there could be a person without that karma? Yes. Like who? Shop! Uh, if there were a blind person in the room, yeah, blind curious, person. they wouldn't see it. Or a colorblind person. Yeah. They just would see it as gray. Okay. That's because they have something wrong with them and not because it's not blue, you see? So that proves in a way that the blue is coming from you. It's very interesting. It's very 
profound. So then in the third turning of the wheel, Lord Buddha said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. Some stuff has its own characteristics and some stuff <laughs> doesn't. Like pens are obviously blue. And especially the fact that it writes. It must have a quality of writing in it, right? Being able to write must be in the pen. If it works, if I can draw something with it, the ability to write something should be inside this, this plastic cylinder, right? Like Lord Buddha, how do you say it? He did a New York Times correction. Uh, if you ever seen on the third page of New York Times, they have a little column and they say, we made these boo-boos last week. It's very honest in a way. Because people don't normally do that. Right? And um, so Lord Buddha said, oh, I made a mistake. You know, people said, people came up to him. Some of the people from the second term ago came up and said, this is too much. Are you telling me this pen doesn't write by itself? And he said, he judged the student and he said, this student can't handle what I'm teaching. I better back off. And he backed off of it. Then, so he said, yeah, you're right, the, blue, the pen is blue, the characteristic of being blue belongs to the pen, writing belongs to the pen, I'm sorry, I was just being figurative, I was just trying to shake everybody up a bit, okay? And then he passed away and he left, he left it like that. Then for two and a half thousand years, people have to figure out, did he mean it when he said he didn't mean it? Okay? <laughs> or did he mean it when he said he meant it? You see? And for two and a half thousand years, people have struggled with this question. So we have a Manjushri Mula Tantra. That's a real Tantra. That's the root Tantra of the angel called Yang Dalyang, or we call it Gentle Voice. And in that book, it says uh, there'll be uh, a monk named Asanga who will come along and he'll straighten everything out. You know, he'll say, Lord Buddha did mean that or didn't mean that, or, you know, Lord Buddha was telling the truth in the second turning of the world. When Lord Buddha was telling truth in the third turning of the wheel. But you notice nobody has much trouble with the first turning of the wheel. Why? He didn't really talk so explicitly about emptiness. Lord Buddha didn't really. Emptiness is where people get screwed up, right? Before they hit tantra. Right? But emptiness is where people get confused. So Lord Buddha taught emptiness in the second and the third turning of the wheel. So if you wanted to write a book about clarifying that series of teachings, first, second, third, turning the wheels, what would you call a book? Shastra. I'm going to explain the latter part, the ultimate part of the series, meaning those series of three, three turnings of the wheel. So I think if you ask a, a thousand people, you might not hear this explanation once. It's very beautiful in Gelsamjay, and it's hard to get out of Gelsamjay. And it will be in your reading if the reading ever occurs. Uh, but you'll see. So in a way, Gyalsa Jay uh, Asanga, Master Asanga, is offering to explain the confusing latter part of that series. And that's why it's called what? Mahajita. Mahayana Mahayana Which of the three turns and wheels is Maya? Uh, which one of the three is Maya? Huh? All three included Maya. Right. You're telling me that the teaching on the four truths is, is Maya? Yes, it's included Maya. Right. So, included in Maya is Maya. Is everything included in Maya is Maya? <laughs> I would do something. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take the series of the paths that are intended for people of blessed capacity. Mahayana, you So I guess it's Mahayana, huh? <laughs> it's part of, it's included. Well, in right, because it's included in Mahayana, right? Yeah. We're at Sa. Why do you So we're supposed to practice that by itself? No. Yeah, because it's Mahayana. No, it doesn't. doesn't oh, it's not Mahayana just because it's included in Mahayana? <laughs> <laughs> Is your foot part of your body? Does that cut your little enough you still have a body? <laughs> anyway, Mahayana was stressed in the last two turns. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, if you take the four great schools of ancient India, the two Mahayana schools, so it would make sense to add a word to the title of our book, which is Mayana Uta Uta Chandra Shastra. 
and he's explaining. Shastra means he's trying to clarify what happened in the latter part of the Buddhist teachings. We have another uh, explanation of this serious thing. Do you anyone remember? What was it? Chang'e. Uh, what's it? Was it the Chang'e thing? Five books. Five books. Yeah, I think five books. We're going to talk a little bit about how this book came to be, how this book came into our world, the Uttara Tantra. So, so everybody calls it Uttara Tantra, but you know that that's just a short name, right? Like people in Tibetan call it Gilama, it's like Gilama. <laughs> but that just means a lot of part of the series. It leaves out Mayana, it leaves out explanation. So people get confused about what the name is. But everybody in Tibet calls it Gilama, it's like Gilama. 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 Uttara Tantra. Uttara Tantra. Okay. Um, it's one of the five great books of Maitreya. Maitreya gave Arya Sangha five great books when Arya Sangha showed up in his heaven one day. Uh, and you guys know the story. I think, I'll run over it real fast, but I think the people who weren't here should get a take or something, because the whole story is kind of cute. But uh, to put it briefly, Arya Sangha tried for 12 years. He didn't do a three-year retreat, he did a 12-year retreat, which is really supposed to be ideal. But we were afraid that caretakers would die. Um, <laughs> uh, and he, in those 12 years, he stayed in uh, solitude in the cave, and he tried to get a vision. He tried to meet Maitreya, and he worked really hard to meet, meet Maitreya. Uh, at the end of the retreat, he still hadn't seen Maitreya. He gave up. He went out. He went to the nearest town. Um, on the way to town, he saw a dog that had been run over by a car. And it was cut here, uh, like squished halfway. And the lower part of the body had been completely eaten away by maggots. Mm -hmm. And they were starting to attack the, the they were starting to attack the upper part of the body. And then uh, he knelt down and he looked at the maggots and he said, I gotta get the maggots off the dog and the dog's gonna die. Then he had the thought, if I take the maggots off, the maggots are gonna die. So he said, you know what I'll do? I'll, I'll get a knife. I'll cut a big piece of flesh out of my thigh, and I'll set it on the ground, and then I'll put the maggots on the flesh. And it won't die, and then the dog will be cured. So he goes to town, he gets a big razor blade, he cuts a big piece of meat off his thigh, and he sets it on the ground, and he starts to reach for the maggots, and he says, if I pick them up, I'll crush them with my fingers. So he says, I'll just lick them off. So, but he's kind of grossed out, so he goes to the knife, and he puts his tongue out, and he goes down, and then, you know the end of the story, he, he hits the ground, and he looks up, and there's my chair. Yeah. And uh, he says to, uh, it's interesting, Arya Sangha's reaction is so interesting. He's, he gives him a line of verse, uh, which is to say, you know, where the hell have you been for 12 years? You know, <laughs> you know I was not, like, he's not all like, Lovey Gummy with my chair, he's sort of pissed off with my chair. <laughs> he's like, you know, are you gonna show me you're going to come to me in the first week, you know, right? <laughs> Twelve years later, you know, now you're showing, I'm already out of the retreat, I've left the retreat, you know, now you're showing yourself to me? And my chair says, you couldn't see me. I was there the whole time, I was sitting right next to you. Sometimes when you clear your throat and spat, doing the mantras, uh, you spit on me, you know? I had to, like, dodge around all the time. And, and uh, Arya Sangha says, well, I don't believe you're in the cave. If you're in the cave, I would have seen you. you know? And... My chair says, oh, so everybody sees things the same way, right? <laughs> and my son says, I think so. I would have seen you, you know, if you were there. <laughs> so my chair says, okay, well, then you take me up on your shoulders and you dance around town with me on your shoulders. And let's see. Let's see what happens. And he does that and he dances around town. And you know the story. Everyone thinks Arya Sang is crazy because he's dancing around town with nothing on his shoulders. And he's saying, look on my shoulders. Look on my shoulders. I got my chair on my shoulders. Uh, and you know the story, one old lady, one bar maid sees uh, a puppy, just a little puppy on one shoulder. And uh, one uh, like laborer, construction laborer, sees, uh, what do you see on the top? Oh, oh, he sees his toe hanging off right here. <laughs> and, <laughs> and as a result, they both made some high tender novel or something, you know. Uh, but in a way, the story of how Oh, and then the story goes that um, my chair said, now that you believe, you believe me? And, and the song says, yeah, okay, I believe you. And he says, well, what did, why were you trying to get to me anyway? What did you want? You know? And the song says, I was trying to figure out emptiness, the, 
the perfection wisdom sutras, and I couldn't do it. I couldn't figure it out. Like he, I figured out all those other books. I understand the Himayana books. I understand all the other Mahayana books. I just can't get this emptiness thing. So my trainer says, "Okay, grab onto my ropes, and we'll take a trip." And he flies into to, to Shia uh, I just read a book this morning that says, "But Arya Sang was able to get back on his own." Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so he flies to this heaven. He spends part of a the morning there, and fifty years pass in human time. And during that time, I, I'm sorry, Maitreya teaches him these five great books of this, uh, Maitreya. Uh, because Arya Sangha says, how am I going to teach everybody what you taught me? Because Maitreya teaches him the whole professional wisdom sutras, which is like, it's about 25, 30 volumes. It's like 3,000 pages or something in, a, in an hour in the morning. Uh, so he says, how can I go back to Earth and teach people this? Can you give me something shorter? So he gives him these five very short books. Um, I thought I would list them again. Well, I don't know if we have time. Yeah, let's do it anyway. Okay. I'm shortening the names for your convenience. Okay. Say Chu. 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 The way things are. So you got things and the way things are. Okay. Namjay means distinguishing. Like this is the things and this is the way things are. Okay, so it's a book about distinguishing things from the way things are. I'm going to go through the progression of the five books. Um, Maitreya taught the five books to Arya Sangha in, a, in an order. And the purpose of the order is to get your mind from simple emptiness up to ultimate emptiness. Okay? So we're going from sort of a, what do you call it? Friendly interpretation of emptiness up to the real one through the five books. Uh, and I'm going to be quoting from Gelsapir's commentary. And we'll talk about who he is later. Uh, but he's a student of uh, Gelsapir. He says if you want to know what things means here, it means the things that appear to you. Things as they appear to you. Like Mr. Ben, am I separate from you? Yes. No. Yes, no. <laughs> 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 Same answer. Oh, my way. Uh, Ultimately or conventionally? Good, good, good. Yeah. Good, good. Uh, it's a great question for Sasha debate. Thank you, Sue. Me and Major, so we are separate or not conventionally? Separate from me. Okay, so I'm over here and you're over there. You're not. Yeah, that's a good way to say it. Okay? I mean, conventionally, you can say, I'm over here and he's over there. And we're stuck. Okay? And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I can't build a house. Ben can build a house. Okay? That's a stuff. We, we can't be the same person or else I can just call him build a house. So we're separate. Um, but are we separate in an ultimate sense? Why not? And, and the answer in the lower schools, okay, we're talking mind-only school, is that my, this person that I'm seeing 
is a result of a seed in my own mind. In that sense, we're not separate. I see a person. There's a functioning, real, talking, working, living person out there. And I'm over here and I'm different. But I see that person because of a seed in my own mind. So in a sense, that person is a projection in my own mind. In that sense, we're not, we're not separate. Okay. Um, so chilla here means what Van called uh, conventionally separate. Okay? I mean, we seem to be separate from each other, right? There's space between us. That's the way things look. And then chin yi means the way things really are, which is that even though it seems that I'm separate from Ben, uh, everything about Ben, every single characteristic of Ben, and Ben himself is a projection of my own mind because I want to project that, right? No. Yeah. Forced to. <laughs> yeah. We always have to say forced to. Okay? My karmic seeds, what, how I treated people in the past, is forcing me to see a person good, bad, mixed, like that. It's totally up to my own how I treat other people. And that's the chini of, of the things that just seem to appear around us. So chi means the way things appear. Chini means the way the, the real situation. Why, why is namje a good word to put in here? Anybody? You got to distinguish between them. You see, you got to distinguish between them. You know, like, like if you get angry at somebody. You fail to distinguish. You think that person exists there. You don't realize it's coming out of your own mind. And if you get angry, what's going to happen? It's going to happen again. But none of us going to happen, you know? You goddamn well better be able to differentiate some day between the way things look and the way things really are. Okay? So that's a great book, right? I think. Uh, what else think about Okay, that's the first, the first book. By the way, if you went up to Arya Sona and said, when you say Ben and you are separate uh, conventionally, um, is it real? You know, is Ben real? So is Ben real? And uh, it depends on how you define real, right? <laughs> if real means the way I, I think of him normally, or usually as I go through my day, would you say it's real? No. Yeah, I think no. If you can still get upset by anybody, the answer is no. Okay? Meaning you you don't really understand how they are. So in this first book, my trainer didn't clarify the meaning of real as far as being there. Okay? He kind of fudged it. He kind of fudged it. You know? He said the appearance is I could say it's real. Oh, real in every way? Oh, you can sort of say that. Okay, so you see where my chair is trying to, he tried to put out his first book a little more, what do you call it? Double day instead of MSTP. He's trying to reach a broad audience that, and he's, and he's watering it down a little bit for the broad audience, okay? And that's the way an author would do that, right? He's got to present it in an easy way. So when people got into, you know, it's been real or not, he said, well, yeah, pretty real. Okay, okay say, what time I'm doing? Who means uh, the center of something? 
and especially of a, along a line, like the center of a line. So it's like left-wing politicians and right-wing politicians, and then what do you call them in the middle? Moderate. 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 Centrists. Yeah. As opposed to center. You see, center mean, mean to, as opposed to center in the meaning of the center of a circle, this is not that. Uh, whenever we say U, in this sense, it means the center of, a, of two extremes, like on a horizontal line. Okay. Um, ta means the extremes. Okay, the two extremes. Namje means distinguishing. distinguishing between the center and the extremes. Okay. What's the center and what are the extremes? Let's see what Kelsey thinks. Uh, in this book, my chair goes one more step, and he says, uh, you know that thing I talked about in the last book I wrote? I want to clarify it a little bit. I want to clarify it a little bit. Some things have their own characteristics, and some things don't. Let's divide it into three. <laughs> okay? So, those of you who studied the Chang'e course of Winston, huh? or uh, the ACA 15 course, um, these are the three, what we call the three characteristics of things that uh, are, are taught by the mind-only school. And I'll just go through them very briefly. You know. uh, does this thing really work the way it seems, according to the mind-only school, Mr. Stone? Yes. Yeah, it rides. It rides on the board. So it's real in that sense. It's true. It exists truly. It's real in that sense. It rides. Okay? Uh, Emptiness itself, Mr. Stone. If you see emptiness, uh, can it really allow you to get light quickly and um, see your future lives, for example? Yes. Yeah, so it functions. So those two things, ultimate reality and working things, changing things, normal stuff in the world, we lumped them together, and in this book, Maitreya says, they exist truly, really. You know, they really exist. But now, what about the root beer flow that's uh, waiting for me behind this blackboard? <laughs> what about the root beer flow that Christy will let me drink? That's <laughs> waiting for me behind this blackboard. Where is that? How real is that? <laughs> I don't see it. Even if it was there, I couldn't drink it. <laughs> so, uh, that's like what we call an imaginary thing. And, and in the mind only school, those don't count as, having, as being real, true, having real characteristics, etc. So we divide all things into three. We, we divide between the, the center and the extremes. You know, it would be too extreme to say nothing exists. It would be too extreme to say nothing has its own characteristic. Okay? Pens have their own, and all the other stuff we normally deal with has their own characteristics. Emptiness must have some kind of power, some kind of characteristic, because when you see it, all this great stuff happens to you. But what use is a, is a root beer flow that doesn't, you know, that you're just thinking of that you know is not there. You know, no function, no benefit. That we throw into unreal things. So that's dividing the middle from the extremes, in this case. So Lord Maitreya introduces those three ideas of the mind only school. Some stuff really exists, some stuff doesn't really exist. So we're still in the mind-only school with these two books, the first two books. We're getting people to emptiness gradually. Which means we're accepting which one of the three turnings of the wheel is this thing. Remember the first turning of the wheel, he just sat down with his four, five guys who had been his tiger cub friends in his past life. <laughs> and he said, uh, look, this is a real bad life. We've got to get out of this thing. Uh, in the second turning of the wheel, he says, Everything's empty. This pen's not blue. Then in the third really box, I said, I'm sorry. Yeah, of course it's blue. Uh, what was my original question? Oh, which school are which which turning of the wheel are we in now? <coughs> the third. Because he's waffling. He's waffling. He's saying, so uh, something's last, nice, something's not, you know? Lord Buddha didn't mean it in the second turning of the wheel. Lord Buddha, Buddha was just being extreme. Why? Shake people up a little bit, wake them up. Okay, sometimes that's necessary. 
Yeah. You said that there are three things covered. Um, and then you went on to say that some stuff exists and some stuff doesn't. According to that school. Those are two things. Things that exist and things that don't. What's the third uh, thing? Now, two of the groups really exist, which is A, changing things, and B, emptiness. And then one of the groups doesn't really exist, which is my root beer shape. Root beer okay. Yeah. Right. Of course, we could change that, you know. Gives you a kind of seed for it. Let's see, I don't know. You can come out with a tiny word. Say, do it again. Do means sutras, meaning the teachings of Lord Buddha, especially the open teachings. Do de means more or less the sutra pitaka, meaning the basket, uh, the whole collection of open teachings. Okay. Gen means gen means an ornament like uh, this uh, bracelet. That would be a gen. And sometimes when you write a book explaining someone else's teachings, you call it like a, a jewel for those teachings, meaning. You know, who am I to make more Buddha's sutras better? But I can sort of pretty them up a little bit with my explanation. Okay? And that's why it's called Dodi Gen. Sutra Alankara. I'm thinking Christopher can make the Sanskrit words for everybody who wants them. And then we can just pass them out, because I don't think we have time to, to do three classes in one. Okay? Uh, but anybody who wants the Sanskrit, then you put pressure on her. I still think it's good for you to have in your pocket when you walk into the, y, the YMCA in Tucson. There's like five shot guys, like Brian Smith things you gotta watch out for. Let's stick them all in Wilson. Winston, sorry. Uh, now, this is how Gelsip J describes it. Look, we're in the third book. This is how Gelsip J describes it. Ninang Denver Drupa Makka. It says, in the third book, uh, Maitreya didn't didn't deny uh, that Ben was real. Okay? Uh, but now the wording has changed, right? In the first two books, he's saying he is real. You know? Like he's a changing thing, he's well like a pen. It's it has its own characteristics. But his description of the third book is, in the third book, my chair doesn't deny it's real. Meaning what? It's a Mahinga. Meaning what? It probably is, but it's a double negative. He doesn't say it's real. You see? In the first two books, he says, Michael's real. You know? As I see him, he's real. But when he gets to the third book, now we're on the third book, he doesn't, he doesn't deny he's real, which implies he doesn't say he's real. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's like a typical monk thing. Okay. Then he says, uh, Then he starts to teach, my trainer starts to teach, how can you wake up the compassion in your own mind? How can you wake up bodhicitta in your own mind? So he's getting heavily into bodhisattva. What, how, do, how do you become bodhisattva? Riksepa means everybody has that seed in them. And that's the big, that's the big subject of the book we're going to study. If someone comes up to you the first day in the YMCA and says, well, what are we going to study? You say, oh, put in nature. You know, this book's all about Buddha nature. There's a Buddha inside of you. Okay? How do you wake it up? How do you realize it? Okay, Rick Sepa. Um, then he says, Chantu Sebe Topa, Kwame Kondu, Kepa the Door, etc. How do you get your bodhisattva qualities to get bigger and bigger, higher and higher? Okay? That's another subject of this third book. Doja Shen, Jason Timmy, Top Gepa, Tena, Bet, this. What are some sneaky ways of collecting students? and attracting them to these ideas, okay? Like movies, or music, or nice. yoga, or business, or <laughs> just beautiful desert. 
<laughs> yeah. Huge art student. Okay. Uh, then he says, um, then he says an interesting thing. He also says, "Shem sumbo tera ki ni dunje sa balatu de dunda matsamji tenki." He says, "The first three books of my trail present the ultimate in a way which is comfortable for the student." Okay, like they present the ultimate, but in a way which is comfortable for those particular people. Key, but. Chitam de Wangi Teniki Dupe Tong by Dundamba Sawamaze. But they don't clearly talk about emptiness in the sense that nothing's got any quality of itself. Okay? Now that in itself is an implication. What? What's he implying? The, the last two do. He says, now the first three, they mention the ultimate reality. But just in sort of a schmoozy way, in a fluffy, fluffy way. Mm -hmm. Because the student couldn't handle it. But they don't clearly state, look, nothing's got any quality in itself. This thing's not blue by itself. This thing's only blue because you're sleeping. Anything you see about me is coming from you. Okay? Anything you see about what I say or how I act is coming from you. Same with the pen, same with your own mind. Same with your world. Same with the last guy who cut you off in traffic. Why get mad at him? Take care of the real thing. Shanti Deva says, don't get mad at the baseball bat, get mad at the, the guy who's swinging it. Come on. You know what I mean? Which is who? Come on. <laughs> Me. Okay. Uh, we got two more books to go. I mean, this is all the history part, it's a little boring, but we'll get to the fun stuff in the next class, right? Uh, maybe it's not so good. Say, don't talk again. Don't talk again. Don't talk again. In Sanskrit, it's Abhisamaya Alankara. Um, this book by Maitreya, we studied for the first 12 years in the monastery. When you enter the Geshe course, and around age 15, you're, you're taught, at 13 to 15, you're taught basic logic and how to debate. And then when you're deemed fit to enter the debating round, you're allowed to start studying the first book. And this is the first book we studied. Twelve years on this book. It's 50 pages long. Okay? You, you, you cover an average of four pages a year. And you spend about ten hours a day working on it. Okay? It's really intense. I mean, this book is really intense. Uh, what does book number four... Oh, if you translated it, it would, it would be the ornament or the jewel of realizations. Wunto means realizations, and gen means the jewel. Again, like a, an ornament. Okay. I'll, I'll just quote Gyatso Jay. Tomba ni gitao tatupa, the ultimate view of emptiness, world view. That's what we call our organization, right? And that's what it means. All the, all the other organizations are all under this thing called world view. Tatu kitao means the ultimate worldview. Yanda Yandu Sun. This book talks about the ultimate worldview over and over and over again. Okay? This book talks about the ultimate worldview of emptiness and karma over and over and over again. Murki. Murki means. But. But. But what? Gyatso did. Then he goes on to say, look, but the main thing that this book teaches is a peculiar idea about three shades of emptiness. We haven't gotten to it, we're not going to get to it in this course. Okay? But there's an idea that there are three kind of like degrees of emptiness, three shades of emptiness. Like the emptiness of a person in its subtle form and its gross form. And the emptiness of this house in its gross form and its subtle form. 
that you could that you could put sort of shades of emptiness, and then you could divide everybody in the world into those people who can see the easiest kind of emptiness, and those people who can see the medium kind of emptiness, and those bodhisattvas who can see the ultimate kind of emptiness, and you can kind of shade emptiness into three different paths, three different ways. Okay, what we call listener, self-made Buddha, and bodhisattva. Okay. And that, this book is mainly devoted to that idea. Is that a Majimika idea? Yeah, it is a high school idea. But is it the highest part of the high school idea? No. No. It's the lower half of the high school. Which is called? You know? Swatanjika. Swatanjika. Meaning, what do we call it? Independent school. school. Yeah. That was the course of the bad. Uh, independent school. So they accept this idea of three shades of emptiness. But the highest, highest, highest school, the consequence school, they don't accept that. Which probably means what book number five is going to be? <laughs> yeah, Gyulama. Just say Gyulama. Gyulama really presents emptiness in its right form. Highest emptiness. I'll call Gyasa J again. This from the Ace Rackman database. Paper Chapa Gyudami Tenchi Daini, the Maya no Tara Tantra Shasta, Gyudama, number of Ipatsam Gitsuba Kombe, is presented for people who are already used to the mind only ideas. Like, if you've been studying all those mind only books, the first three books, right, of the five, and you got used to the idea of emptiness. In a sort of easy way, fluffy way, way, then you've been set up for the Gilama. So Gilama is for them. It says something which should be taught later on to people who have already been dragged through the first three books. Okay? <laughs> they understand emptiness roughly. They understand the thing about them being created by the seeds in my mind. And in that sense, we're not separate. That's a lower emptiness. That's a lower emptiness. Okay? Why? Guess? It has to do with kunshi. Yeah, nice. Okay? I'll say it again. Uh, the mind only school, the first three books, they only get as far as Ben's being projected by the seeds in my mind. Okay? But the assumption is. The seeds in my mind are real. The projector is real. OK, everything I'm seeing, everything I experience, even myself, that's a projection. But that special box out of which reality is pouring in my own mind, that box has got to be real. That much has got to be real, OK? And then in the fifth book, they come along and say, uh-uh, even that box is your projection. The projector is your projection, okay? And then we gotta get, we gotta talk about that. That's a big argument in the Gyulama. That's a big subject in the Gyulama. And the point is that half the people you teach at the YMCA, they never heard of this idea of stuff coming out of a box in your mind. And you gotta judge the people. You gotta say, am I gonna present Gyulama the, the way the first three books were presented, or maybe even before that, you know? And you gotta, you'll be in a, stuck in the same situation as Lord Buddha. You'll be stuck with five or ten students from Kansas, maybe, or wherever. Except now the people I meet from Kansas are really smart. But anyway, um, you know, and you gotta jet, you'll, right on the spot, you'll start to say, now look, you Lama's talking about this Kunshi thing, and, and you know, the Kunshi's just a projection too, and it's a projector, and they're gonna be like, you know, and then you're gonna have to back up. Uh, at the third turning of the wheel, back up, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. Um, well, there's this Buddhism thing, you know, and, and you've got to be nice to people, and, uh, you know, and uh, Gyu, Gyu Lama helped you out with that, and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, you got, yeah, you got to take out your pen and start. And, you know, you'll be stuck in that position, like, boom, from the first moment. You look in their faces, you start to talk about Gyu Lama, and then you'll adjust. You know, you'll do tonguey. You'll go to the... To wherever their level is, you'll have to adjust to that. You know, that's uh, part of our job. That's what we do for a living. Right? We just adjust to the audience at the moment. Um, so anyway, Gyu Lama, in the fifth book, my trainer says, look, even the projector's a projection. 
Even the projectors are projected. Okay? And then he really begins to describe w what's literal and what's not literal in the fifth book. Okay? So since you guys are so great, we're going straight to the fifth book, uh, which is Gilama. Um We're going to take a break, but just before that, I want to say one more thing. When Arya Sangha came back to Earth, and all his friends were dead. He's like Rip Van Winkle, right? <laughs> I know that I was only gone for two years, and half of them are dead. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> and he comes back, and he says, how am I going to teach this to people, you know? And he gets eight good students. And they go out in the middle of nowhere, like Bowie, Arizona. You know? He says, I don't care. Eight good students is enough. He takes them out in the middle of nowhere. It's a forest in Magadha State in India. And they go out in the forest. They go out in the middle, like just a tent in the middle of a mesquite, you know. And he says, I'll get these eight people to understand what this is all about. And he really works hard on them. He gets them up to Sipa, which is almost up to seeing emptiness directly. And he gets them up to where they can read other people's minds. And you know, it's not like you wake up one morning and you can read what somebody else wants for breakfast uh, directly. But you wake up and you have a sense. It's just like a sense. Like, you're kind of thinking, maybe Pema would like tuna fish for lunch, you know? And it's just a, a sense that you have, you know? And you make it, and then she's really happy, and it's like the beginning of sh uh, Shensem Shepa, which is reading other people's minds. And then as you practice more and more and more, it becomes more and more uh, clear in your own mind to where you can actually hear them talking in their own mind. But it starts with some kind of a instinct about what other people need or want. or And um, if you're going to teach people, like at the YMCA, uh, it's really helpful. You can imagine how helpful it would be. Like, you, before you walk into the room, you know whether you're going to have to back up or not. You see what I mean? And so for a teacher, it's really useful. So Arya Sangha was working really hard on his first aid students to get them up to this level where they could at least have a strong instinct for what those people need, their, their students need. And you know the story. Eventually, he got invited to a king's palace. Um, the king wants to test him because he doesn't believe he's such a great yogi. And he puts him through these tests. Uh, and you know some of the tests, but I'll repeat one. He gets a golden urn made of pure gold. And inside, he puts a bunch of snot and paws and poo poo and pee pee. And then on the top, he puts about an inch of honey. And then he he like says to Arya Sangha, guess what I got in the pot? You know? <laughs> and, uh, and Arya Sangha says, I know what's in the pot and I wouldn't need it, you know? And, and so the king is like, well, anybody could tell that kind of thing. Um, and then the king asks Arya Sangha six questions, mentally, in his mind, about the perfection of wisdom sutras. Like he beamed six questions to Arya Sangha. Uh, we're going to cover those after the break, so you've got to come back. Uh, so take a break for 10-15 minutes, and just relax and uh, uh, go to the bathroom. It does for you also. Yeah? And there's, there's a big uh, thing of cookies in the refrigerator. You can spread those. Yeah. And, we'll, and then just relax and come back in 10-15 minutes. Okay. Thanks. 